2020, the social media platform now known as X asked its users to describe the year with one word. People from all over the world gave various responses, including skip, delete, edit, and so on. Some were comedic, some were uh, clever, and uh, some were controversial. But by far, the most popular word that users of X agreed on was the word unprecedented. Unprecedented. It was the year, you'll remember, how could you forget, uh, that due to the coronavirus, the world went into lockdown, something that it had never really done, particularly on that scale before. Adults were told to work from home, children learned their school lessons online and supermarkets restricted custom. It really was an unprecedented year and it was a year I'm sure we hope we'll never live to experience again. But whatever our experience of the year 2020, and though uh, it was called by various media outlets and was, uh, was voted as an unprecedented year, it was nothing compared to the events of the birth of Jesus Christ. That really was unprecedented. And so let's consider the unprecedented birth of Jesus as we took, take a look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. We're going to see three things. Firstly, I want you to notice an unprecedented time, an unprecedented time in verses 1 to 7. Now, as, Luke, as, we, as we open the chapter, Luke wants us to be certain. Remember, he's told us this from the very beginning. He wants us to be certain uh, that the birth of Jesus Christ was an historic event. Luke is not uh, writing a, a, a once upon a time story that happened a long, long time ago and in a far, far away land. Luke is telling us about real places and real people. He is an excellent historian. In fact, uh, throughout the, the, the last 2,000 years, any time he has been criticised, um, he has later been vindicated by archaeology. He is, an, he is an excellent historian. And so he begins uh, chapter 2, uh, and he begins the narrative of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ by telling us what was happening not only for Mary and Joseph, but also on the wo world stage at that time. Notice the political circumstances. Verses 1 and 2, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So here he, he begins not with Mary, not with the, uh, with the Lord Jesus, not even with Joseph. He begins with the most powerful man living in the Roman Empire at that time, the Emperor Augustus. Now Augustus uh, was, uh, was a, an important, a significant person for us to take notice of. Um, following the murder of his uncle Julius, he uh, set about avenging his death. He uh, went to war with those who were seeking to seize power and he successfully defeated them, becoming the sole ruler of the Roman world. His reign, which lasted from the year 27 BC until 14 AD, has become known as a time of peace and prosperity for the Roman world, so much so that it is uh, often referred to as Pax Romana, Roman peace. And it's at this time of peace that he is enabled to call a census on the whole of his empire, not merely so that he can uh, keep records of birthdays and death days, but so that he is able to tax its citizens. 
This was one of various uh, censors that Augustus ordered. Those were the political circumstances. But notice also the social circumstances, verse 3. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. Do you see the power of this single man, Augustus? There is no one like him in the entire world at that time. When he speaks, he is able to get the whole world moving. Ordinary men and women commanded to return to their places of origin, where their families had originally come from, to be registered. For some people, this would have meant that they needed to spend days and even weeks travelling long and treacherous journeys in danger of being, um, of, of being attacked by highway robbers and, and all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of things. Because often these journeys would be on foot, Forget the uh, picture of, um, that, that you get on your Christmas card uh, in December of, you know, this, uh, this th- th- here comes Joseph and Mary riding on a donkey. We don't, we don't find that in Scripture. And, and what would it have been like if you, were, uh, if you were on the move, if you were part of those citizens who are... Uh, who are going to be registered. Well, you would uh, find the villages, the towns, the cities find themselves inundated with people looking for places to stay. Hustle and bustle, busyness. But then notice the individual circumstances. You see what Luke's doing? He's zooming out from the world stage all the way down to the local level and then into the individual level where we meet Mary and Joseph, verses 4 to 7. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. So among the great throng of people on the move, we see that Mary and Joseph are moving too. Mary is the blessed of of God, but she is not exempt from the Roman law. And they are making the 80-mile journey from Nazareth in Galilee, where they were currently living, to the, the ancient city of King David, Bethlehem. And as they arrive, they are looking for somewhere to stay. The problem is, there's no room. The crowds have come, they've got there before them. And Mary, now heavily pregnant, approaching full term, is forced to give birth in a room or an area full of animals. Again, notice no mention of a stable, but it's likely this was a room where animals were uh, kept and she has to use a manger, a feeding place for animals, as a crib for her newborn baby. Hardly the envy of every new mother. And what do we learn from all the political and social and individual upheavals that Luke details in in these first few verses of chapter 2? Well, we learn that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Here is God using a pagan emperor in order to fulfil, to accomplish the promises of Scripture that he had made through his prophets a long time ago. He is uh, no uh, powerless God. He is no local deity who only has authority in a particular geographical location. This is the sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth. He is the God who who we've been hearing about in Daniel, who uh, establishes 
kingdoms and causes kingdoms to fall. Here is the one who can humble the most powerful emperors of the world with ease. And here is the God who can use a pagan emperor, the most powerful man in the world, and the, uh, and the circumstances, the mundane, ordinary circumstances of ordinary people in order to fulfil all of his plans and purposes for the world. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. The Lord says, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, in the days of Micah, there were two Bethlehems. In the days of Jesus, there was one. And it was Bethlehem, Ephrathah. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Mary and Joseph are located in Nazareth of Galilee. The birth of the Messiah is prophesied to happen in Bethlehem. How does God get uh, a man and a woman uh, uh, to, to go at just the right time to just the right place? He puts it on the heart of a godless king to have a census. Brothers and sisters, even unprecedented times in your life and unprecedented circumstances are not outside the sovereign plans and purposes of Almighty God. Believe that he will use them for his glory and he will use them for your good. But then secondly, I want you to notice an unprecedented event in verses 8 to 14. We're now taken away from the crowded city to the sparse fields outside Bethlehem. And Luke chooses not to tell us about the visit of the noble wise men who followed the star from the east. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, at least I find it interesting that uh, what Luke chooses to tell us and what Luke chooses not to tell us. No, he'll let Matthew tell us about the noble wise men. He wants to tell us about the humble shepherds. He wants to tell us about not the kings in their palaces, just like Augustus, but he wants to tell us about the shepherds on the fringes of society. I love Luke's gospel. And what, 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 what happened? Well, there is an appearance of an angel. Uh, we, we, we've been getting used to this, haven't we, in Luke, in Luke chapter 1 and ch chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. Do you see? Uh, let's pause there. Here, here are these, these shepherds, and these are ordinary men about going about their ordinary business of keeping watch over their sheep at the, in the night. Uh, looking on out for the natural predators such as lions and wolves and anything that might uh, ruin their livelihood and diminish their wealth by stealing and killing the sheep. And suddenly, we read that an angel of the Lord appeared before them. We're not told if this is Gabriel or if this is another angel. An angel of the Lord appeared and the, accompanying this angel is the brightness of the glory of God shining in that darkness. They had never encountered such a sight and the result is that they are filled with great fear. These men who would have been used to the rough and tumble of life, these men who, like David, would have been used to fighting lions. They are filled with fear at the sight of this angelic being. Get rid of any picture of uh, little babies with wings and halos over their heads. That's not, what, that's not how the Bible pictures of an angel. These are heavenly warriors. And then we see the announcement of an angel, verse 11 to 12. If, well, let's read verse, from verse 10. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, 
I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Here is this warrior and supernatural warrior being clothed in the glory of the Lord and he recognises the fear of these men. And they tell these men not to be, he tells these men not to be afraid. This is, this is just like it was with Zechariah when the angel appeared before Zechariah and, the, and Zechariah is filled with fear and the angel says, don't fear, I've got good news for you. Uh, and, the, and when Mary uh, sees the angel appear before her and she is filled with fear and she cannot understand the saying, the greeting that he gives and he tells her, do not fear, I bring you good news. And now here are the shepherds. They are also cowering from the glory of God and from the, the appearance of this angel. And again, the angel says, do not be afraid. I don't think it's so much that angels are necessarily compassionate. I believe that it's th that the God they serve is. He's compassionate. And here, here the angel comes bringing good news. Not, you see, the glory of God, when we are confronted with the glory of God, there, there is one response. Oh, what a sinful man I am. When we have really encountered the glory of God, that is the natural response. The natural response is to say, I'm a sinful person. To cower from him. To ask him to depart from us. But in his grace and in his mercy, in his kindness, he says, do not be afraid. The angel says, do not be afraid. I'm bringing you good news. Not news that is going to make you uh, fearful, but news that is going to give joy, not only to you, but to all people. There is a baby who is born in Bethlehem. And this baby is not an ordinary baby like all the others. This is the one you've been waiting for. This is the one God has been speaking about through the centuries. This is the one who is both Saviour and who is Lord. He is Christ, which means anointed one. He's King. And where will they find this newborn King? He will not be found in an expensive crib, a gold-plated cot. He will not be found hidden behind the doors of a royal palace with guards on the gate. He will be found wrapped in cheap swaddling cloths, lying in a makeshift cot. or oh, the humility of the Son of God. And then we see the assembly of many angels, verse 13 to 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Can you even begin to picture it? As soon as the angel announced the good news, he is joined by a multitude of angels. The king of glory, God's own son, has entered the world in great humility. It has gone unnoticed by everyone in Bethlehem. And so heaven so used to being in the presence of the Son of God and praising him from the moment they were created, 
cannot remain silent. It w- the angels will not allow this event in history to go, un- to go uh, past uh, wi- without any celebration, without any glory, without any praise being given. And so if men will not praise, these angels will. And he- heaven invades into uh, earthly space as these angels appear alongside this messenger who has been sent to the shepherds and they sing to the glory of God and they sing about the peace that he is extending through this child to all people. Peace not, not in the sense of what the world expects, not peace in which uh, we, we all kind of live together, it doesn't matter how we, how we are or, or what we do, It's this peace in the first place between God and the sinner because we are by nature at enmity with God. We are by nature hostile to God in our souls, in our hearts. And and we need a saviour who can come and who can change us from the inside, who can bring peace between those who have been hostile to God, far from God, and, and to bring peace from a holy God who must punish sin. This is not the temporal peace offered by Augustus. This is not Pax Romana. This is eternal peace through the forgiveness of sins, which cost the Lord Jesus Christ his body and his blood on Calvary's cross. This unprecedented event with the shepherd shows us that Jesus' birth is good news for all people. God's mercy and salvation is not extended to the privileged few, but to the many ordinary men and women, people like you and people like me. God's mercy reaching the sinner. Oh, what a saviour. And lastly, I want you to notice an unprecedented response in verses 15 to 20. An unprecedented response. Because in the remaining verses, Luke shows us what happened once the shepherds returned to heaven. Uh, Once once the angels (laughs) returned to heaven heaven you caught me well done um then so (laughs) the shepherds quickly respond to the angels uh the angels news leaving their sheep uh, to look for the for the lord Uh, and so let's notice two things firstly uh what what they saw and secondly what they said what they saw and what they said verse 16 to 17 I'll try and compose myself. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. So, so here are the excited shepherds. They, Luke, Luke, Luke doesn't explain to us how they knew where to find Mary and Joseph. They're not given directions that we're told about. But we are told that they did find the place and they did see what the angel had said was true. They went investigating, they went searching and they did not delay, they went with haste. And what do they see? They see this king, this saviour, just as the angel said, wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, an unusual place for the king of glory to be lying. And then we're told what they said, verse 18 and 20. And all, uh, well, let's start with verse 17 again. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. As soon as they see the, the, the angel's words were true, what do they do? They speak about it. They tell Mary about it. Remember, it's likely that Mary was the one who gave Luke his information. 
she is, she's the one who told him all about the shepherds, I imagine. Because they told her everything that they had been told and everything that they had seen. But the shepherds don't stop with Mary. Because Luke tells us that there are others in the vicinity who hear this as well. And they are caused, just as at the birth of John, to wander. They now wander. They are full of awe. They're, they're, they're trying to understand what these things are about. And Mary, Mary be- treasures these things in her heart. She, she stored them up. These were precious moments. She treasures them there in her heart and she turns them over. She thinks about them. She meditates on them. What these things could mean. Who this child is going to grow to be. This child who would, who would go to the cross and it would be like a sword going through her heart. You see, these shepherds, they, had come, they may have come from the fields quietly, but they certainly didn't return quietly. But they go through the streets praising and glorifying God for everything he has done. Because that's the response of someone who has experienced the salvation of God. They can't keep quiet. They can't be shut up. They can't not sing. They can't not speak. I wonder, have you, how have you responded to the message that the Saviour has come and he has come bringing peace with God? Would you follow the example of the shepherds who believed the message that they heard from the angel? Because that's the shock, that's the surprise of this passage. These outcasts from society, these lowly, humble shepherds, these men who were rarely there in the city, where, you know, the city's the place where it all happens. They responded with faith as soon as they heard from the angel. But notice they did not leave their brains at the door. We keep, I keep emphasising this from Luke because Luke is wanting his readers to investigate these things. And what is it the shepherds do? The shepherds believe the angel, but the shepherds act on what they've been told by the angel and they make haste to be sure that these things really happened. That this is true, that they're not uh, being hoaxed in some way. And what did their investigations lead to? It led to them to the Saviour. And so, uh, uh, believe me, if you're someone who is uh, perhaps thinking about Christianity, uh, don't believe the popular media and the popular opinion that believes that religious people just leave their brains at the door because, in fact, if you're a Christian, if if you are seeking the Christian faith, we would invite you to investigate the evidence because it's all there. Find out for yourself. And if you have already believed, if you have already done the, 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 the research, if you have come to faith in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, then follow the shepherd's example in telling others the good news of salvation. You may not have all the answers, but you are able to share the things that you have seen and that you have heard just as the shepherds did. One of my favourite spiritual songs um, says this, and I'll close with these words. There are some people who say we cannot tell whether we are saved or whether all is well. They say we can only hope and trust that it is so. But I was there when it happened, and I guess... I ought to know. Yes, I know when Jesus saved me, the very moment he forgave me, 
He took away my heavy burden. He gave me peace within. Satan can't make me doubt it. It's real, and I'm going to shout it. I was there when it happened, and so I guess I ought to know. How about you?